Kakariko Village is a familiar name in the Zelda series, a reoccurring landmark in Hyrule's landscape, though different in each installment. From a Japanese-style Shika village, Hylian farming settlement, to something straight out of a classic western. But by far my favorite rendition of this iconic village is the one found in Ocarina of Time, a quaint little town at the foot of another famous landmark, the active volcano Death Mountain, home of the Gorons. But it's not the town itself that makes this place so interesting. It only has a small handful of buildings and inhabitants, most of which don't play a key role in the story. And yet this seemingly peaceful little village holds a plethora of some of Ocarina of time's biggest mysteries. The cursed family living inside the Skultula house, the origins of the Song of Storms, haunted graveyard, and of course a woman who is allergic to cuckoos yet choosing cuckoo farming as her profession. Why would you do that? Seriously, that's like a peanut farmer with a severe peanut allergy. But the biggest mysteries about Kakariko Village are not the ones found on the surface, but rather that which lies underneath. By far the craziest and most unsettling aspect about Kakariko is that right below the feet of its unsuspecting settlers lies a vast network of tunnels, caves, rooms and corridors, which when put together are way bigger than the actual village that stands above ground. Most famous are of course the Shadow Temple and its sister mini dungeon, the Bottom of the Well, two locations which on their own already hold a lot of mystery, especially because of their gruesome, haunting atmospheres and aesthetics, hints of torture, imprisonment, mass graves, and even the living dead are a common sight down here. The more you uncover about Kakariko Village, the more you realize that there is something seriously wrong with this place. And today we will attempt to get a bigger picture, to see why and how this part of Hyrule came to be so wretched. Together with Nintendo Black Crisis, we will cover the construction of Kakariko's underground, its ties to the Sheikah, dark history, implications of spirit magic, how this all ultimately led to some eerie and unforeseen consequences, and even a possible connection to Breath of the Wild and its upcoming sequel. There is a lot to dissect, so join us as we take a deep dive into the curious case of Kakariko Village. Although Kakariko Village is a Hylian settlement by the time the events of the game take place, it is told to us that in the past it was predominantly a Sheikah village instead, a place where they lived and operated from during one of Hyrule's most brutal conflicts, the Hyrulean Civil War. The Sheikah basically served as a sort of secret police for the Kingdom of Hyrule, an elusive tribe who operated from the shadows, out of sight from the public eye on behalf of the royal family. By the time we visit the village in Ocarina of Time, the conflict has only been resolved for about nine years. The Sheikah are close to extinction, with its only known living member being Impa, who now serves as Princess Zelda's personal caretaker. The rest of the tribe has been laid to rest in Kakariko's graveyard, and the village itself has since become occupied by Hylians. As is often in bloody conflicts, all sides like to think of themselves as the righteous ones the good guys in the story. Hence, the gruesome fate of prisoners of war are preferably kept out of public sight. And for good reason. I mean, from what we can see, the stuff the Sheikah were doing isn't exactly something you would want the world to see. Obviously, the royal family of Hyrule had a reputation to uphold, and signs of such cruelty would stain that reputation. And this is where Kakariko Village allegedly came into play. Given their secretive nature, the Sheikah were the perfect candidates to catch, imprison, and dispose of prisoners of war, and their hometown basically became ground zero for these horrible acts of war. However, to obscure the cruelty carried out in the name of Hyrule's royal family, they either constructed new underground structures in and around the village, or repurposed those that were already there before, like the Bottom of the Well for instance. These structures, such as the aforementioned Shadow Temple and Bottom of the Well, would serve as both prisons, torture sites, as well as the final resting place for the unfortunate souls taken down here, never to be seen again. Now, this is all nothing new. There have been theories about these locations and practices for decades, and most agree that this was indeed the most likely purpose of these underground locales. All the evidence seems to point at this scenario. But what it doesn't explain is exactly how these places, as well as the town above, became so ripe with curses, 
hauntings and vast amounts of undead lurking beneath the surface. I mean, it's likely that many people died all over Hyrule during the Civil War, right? So how did Kakariko in particular come to be so tainted? The fact that a lot of people died here doesn't automatically explain why they would rise from the grave. There has to be more to it than that. A catalyst which led up to all of this. It's clear that the Shika did quite a bit of digging in and around Kakariko. The Shadow Temple and Bottom of the Well are already pretty extensive, but these are not the only underground sections found around the village. Looking at it from above shows just how much underground space there is below this little town. And my best guess would be that these underground sections were all excavated and built by the Shika around the same time, given their similar architecture. Some may have even been connected at some point, or were at least planned to be connected but never finished after the excavations were abandoned. First we have the Shadow Temple whose entrance is inside the graveyard, we have the royal family's tomb bordering the temple, and some of the other smaller chambers inside some of the graves and one in the center of town. Then we have Dumpe's grave, which is a vast network of man-made corridors and tunnels snaking underneath the graveyard and into the village itself. It's safe to assume that this grave was not dug solely for the purpose of Dumpe's final resting place. It's a bit excessive for one person, wouldn't you agree? Not to mention we find multiple skeletons remains here, indicating that more than just one individual was buried here. The crypt also has frequent dead ends, and some of these tunnels look like they were still under construction by the time the project was abandoned. All this ultimately connects directly to the windmill inside the village. The windmill in turn is capable of draining the well outside, giving access to the bottom of the well. We even see a schematic of the windmill hanging on the wall, which clearly depicts that it has mechanisms and access points extending below ground. And judging from the size comparison, the bottom of the well runs right underneath the windmill. All this points to these underground sections being much more connected than we are visually allowed to see. It's almost like an underground city existing below Kakariko, and the villagers who live out their lives here don't seem to be aware of the horrors that lie only a few meters deep. So we have a vast interconnected network where some horrific events took place, out of sight from the general public. Interesting for sure, but it still doesn't explain the connection of the dead coming back to life, the accursed, and other oddities plaguing this town. What is perhaps most alarming about Kakariko's underground is that with the exception of one grave which leads to a fairy fountain, every single one of these underground areas houses the reanimated corpses known as Redeads. Even the royal family's tomb is not exempt from this. There's been a lot of debate in the past about whether or not Redeads are actual zombies or not. This uncertainty stems from the fact that Smash Bros. Melee included a trophy of a Redead stating that they were nothing more than magic animated into hideous humanoid shapes. It even points to Ganondorf being the source of the Redeads, something that is never made clear in the actual game. However, we fully side with Zeltic on this matter. There's simply too much evidence that contradicts the Melee's trophy, and instead points to Redeads indeed being Hyrule's equivalent of zombies, aka the reanimated bodies of the deceased, and not just magic clay figures, so to speak. And if we as Zelda fans had to choose, obviously information from the main game will always have priority over a trophy in an unrelated fighting game. We won't get into too many specifics, as that is a theory on its own, but watch Zeltic's video if you want to know more. What is important to note, however, is that it is quite literally impossible that Redeads are solely Ganondorf's doing. Not only do Redeads exist outside Hyrule, in places like Termina, far from Ganondorf's reach, but the Redeads in the royal family's tomb were clearly there before Ganondorf's invasion of Hyrule. You can access the tomb long before his power grab, and up until that point, Ganondorf was still laying low and playing nice with Hyrule's leadership. The ancient scriptures carved inside the royal crypt also directly refer to the living dead, another indication that the existence of the Redeads was a known fact long ago, perhaps even back when the tomb was built. It stands to reason then that the same thing goes for all other Redeads in this general area. The ones in Hyrule Castle could very well be placed here by Ganondorf, but for the ones in Kakariko it just doesn't add up. Not to mention we also have Deadhand, Gibdos, and other undead enemy types roaming the catacombs of the village as well. And even Bongo Bongo seems to share the same traits of an undead being. 
how exactly this was all achieved remains totally unexplained. But there is one particular thing that, in our opinion, could provide a strong hint. Something that a lot of these locations have in common. When visiting the bottom of the well, the Shadow Temple, and even the royal family's tomb, one might stumble upon these pools containing some weird green substance. Not only that, but in the case of the well and the Shadow Temple, they are found at the deepest level of the structure. This liquid is harmful to the touch, dealing a quarter heart of damage to Link when he comes into contact with it. What this stuff actually is is never explained in the game, but it's only found in these parts of Hyrule and nowhere else. Now, in the Zelda series, green energy has always had a connection to a couple of things, two of which being spirits and magic. And there's an argument to be made that the two are one and the same, or at the very least deeply connected. In Breath of the Wild we find the luminous stones which are said to house the spirits of the dead, the green glow emitted by the deceased such as King Rome and the champions, and of course the green spiraling energy surrounding the corpse in the reveal trailer of Breath of the Wild 2. The correlation between spirit energy and magic is made even more clear by the champion abilities. When Link frees one of the deceased champions they will bestow parts of their soul upon him, giving him access to the magic ability they possessed in life. We know that magic is important to the Sheikah, even as far back as Ocarina of Time. The door leading to the Shadow Temple requires the use of magic to be opened. The Lens of Truth, which is a Sheikah artifact, literally runs on magic. And in other installments, the Sheikah utilize natural resources such as crystals and liquids to power their technology. In Breath of the Wild this is framed as something scientific, but it might as well be magic in the eyes of those who don't understand its inner workings. And even here, spirit energy is still utilized, as the divine beasts require the spirit of a powerful individual to be operated. Again, there is clearly a blurred line between science and magic in this universe. Perhaps by the time of Breath of the Wild, these processes were better understood by the Sheikah, hence it took on the shape of science rather than magic. One thing we know for sure is that certain individuals can conjure up magic on their own, Ganondorf being a good example, though we also have Vati, Princess Zelda herself, and more recently, the four champions of the Divine Beasts, beings who through the power of their spirit have access to magical abilities. But this seems to be quite rare in Hyrule. Most ordinary people don't seem to have the gift of magic. And interestingly enough, Link himself too doesn't have magic powers of his own, at least not in Ocarina of Time. He's only able to use magic because of certain weapons and artifacts, enchanted objects with magic power which grant him access to a variety of spells and attacks. In that sense, anyone could potentially use this magic if they're in possession of one of these objects, without inherently having powers themselves. So here's a crazy idea. What if during the excavations below Kakriko village, the Sheikah dug so deep that they accidentally stumbled upon an underground pocket containing this green substance, which then spilled out and pulled up inside these caves. And to take it even further, that this was the first discovery of spirit magic in liquid form, a ghostly substance or fuel seeping through the cracks of the earth, which allowed for the enchantment of objects, powering technology, and other access to magic for those not naturally gifted. It could have even been the reason why the Hylians gained the upper hand in the Civil War. The discovery of destructive magic able to be used by common soldiers would no doubt turn the tides in a war mostly fought with medieval weaponry. However, because this was a new discovery, it stands to reason that this substance wasn't well understood at the time. After the initial discovery, the Sheikah, being the scientists we know them to be, likely studied it extensively, experimented with it, and one of the discoveries made could have been the effect it had on the dead, and it is this that may have led to the intentional or unintentional creation of the first re-deads. By the looks of it, the green lake found at the bottom of the well seems to be the location where the liquid was first discovered, as this part of the well still looks like a natural cave. The walls are not made of brick, nor are they decorated like they are on the upper levels. It still genuinely looks like an actual excavation site. There's also signs of this green energy being studied here, as there are man-made walkways laid across the lake and we even see hands sticking out of the pool, an indication that the Sheikah may have attempted to resurrect bodies by throwing them inside, or even more 
morbid, gone as far as to throw live prisoners in as a way of testing the effects. Perhaps the Sheikah first figured that this liquid may hold the potential for eternal life or bringing back loved ones. The royal family could have seen great potential in this as well, which could explain why the liquid is also found inside the royal crypt. As opposed to the bottom of the well where this liquid seems to have pulled up naturally, here it is evenly distributed into what seems to be man-made gutters or basins, almost as if it was placed here on purpose. So could this have been one of the first attempts to resurrect the deceased? Perhaps the kings and queens of old who had long since passed? That or the liquid along with the redads were purposely placed here to protect the royal crypt. Either way, it's pretty messed up. If this is true, it probably didn't take long for the Sheikah to realize that those brought back from the dead had little to no humanity left in them. No cognitive ability at all, just mindless zombies and nothing more. Even so, Hyrule's leadership may have ordered them to continue creating redads and other undead creatures such as Deadhand, essentially creating an undead army to serve the kingdom. Heck, even Bongo Bongo could very well be one of these creations. Had this substance only been found in the bottom of the well in the Shadow Temple, we could have simply concluded that it's a byproduct of Bongo Bongo, something it produces or gives him more power. But the fact that it's also found in the royal family's tomb, which is built inside a former Sheikah village, makes me point to them as the ones who messed around with this stuff and placed it in some of these locations. After all, this stuff is already there when Link enters the tomb as a child, which is before Bongo Bongo breaks free. Anyway, while all these attempts at necromancy were going on, the Sheikah advanced their research into the green substance further and further. And as crazy as it sounds, this ghostly fluid may have even served as the basis for the creation of the first magic potions. Perhaps at some point they could have been successful in processing or refining it into something that is consumable and harmless to the user. Funnily enough, this would also fit the Zelda timeline as a whole, since no game taking place prior to Ocarina of Time features a magic meter. In some of these installments, green colored potions are present, such as the stamina potion, but these don't have any correlation with magic. Later on, new ways may have been found to extract or produce magic potion without having to dig underground. The game never explains where magic potion comes from, but in later games they are produced from chew jelly among other things. Although choo choos are not present in Ocarina of Time, they are found in Termina, as is magic potion, so it's unlikely that the substance below Kakariko is the only way to obtain magic. However, the possibility still remains that this was the first time the Hylians and the Sheikah first came into contact with it. With access to replenishable magic, the Sheikah subsequently created the Lens of Truth and other magical artifacts which ran on magic power. However, the fact remained that the unprocessed version of the liquid found below the village had a serious dark side to it. Be it during or after the war, the Sheikah and royal family may have realized that the undead created in these morbid experiments either served their purpose or were hard to keep under control and too dangerous to keep around. As such, the entrances to these underground crypts and chambers were sealed off, trapping the dead, including Bongo Bongo, inside. Something which, according to the backstories, Impa played a big role in. Here they remained, sealed away in darkness for what was presumably intended to be all eternity. And the green energy remained festering underground, its fumes continuing to rise, filling the underground caves and crypts with its dark influence. But we're not done yet. There is even more evidence that the discoveries of the Sheikah made in Kakariko's underground were significant, something which advanced their understanding of magic and technology in this era. In several houses around Hyrule, books with the famous Sheikah eye symbol on it can be found laying around. These include Impa's house, the Skulchula house, the medicine shop at Hyrule Castle Town, Granny's potion shop in Kakariko Village, the Lakeside Laboratory, and lastly, Dompe has one stashed away inside his shack as well. As the symbol suggests, these books were clearly written by the Sheikah, and since most of them were dead by the end of the war, they were probably written before the war was over. AKA, during the time that these supposed experiments and discoveries were taking place around Kakariko Village. Is it a coincidence then that both medicine potion shops in Hyrule have Sheikah literature lying around? Books written by the same tribe who potentially discovered and refined magic. They aren't found in any of the other establishments either. Not the Bazaar, Goron Shop, Zora Shop, nor the Kokiri Shop, or any other house in Hyrule for that matter, has one of these books lying around. As for the other locations these books are found, these two make perfect sense. Impa's house is pretty obvious, of course, as she is a Sheikah, the only still living member we know of. 
The Lakeside Laboratory makes sense too, since, well, it's a laboratory. A place where research is done, so naturally they would have books written by the most advanced race in Hyrule. Coincidentally, the scientist working here also happens to be the only person in Hyrule who knows that the spooky mask, which resembles the face of a redead, is made from an actual coffin. Could be something that he learnt from the book as well. How else would he know such a specific detail? Dompei being in possession of one of the books seems a bit out of place at first, until you realize that he is literally tending to a big part of lands that hide the secrets below Kakariko. Being a pretty old guy, and with access to the Shika writings, he was probably well aware of Kakariko's dark history and some of the stuff that lay underneath it. This also explains why he specifically chose the one grave he knew had a giant network of caves inside it as his final resting place, as well as the hiding place of his most treasured possession, the Hookshot. Lastly, we have the Skulchula House. This one isn't much of a surprise either, and may even explain the origin of the curse cast upon the father and his five sons who reside here. In the game, it's never fully explained where the spider curse came from. All we know is that it was the result of their greed. They are described and even depicted as a family who was once very rich, which suggests that the curse was cast upon them due to their never-ending desire for more wealth. But who's to say that this so-called greed is referring to physical wealth such as rupees? Greed can come in many forms, including power. And since we find a Shiga book covered in cobwebs inside their house, it may very well be possible that they were tampering with some other stuff. Stuff related to the Shika, as it seems. A possible connection between the family and the Shika tribe can be found in the Shard of Agony. Previously known as the Stone of Agony on the Nintendo 64, it's a relic which can magically track down hidden caves and grottos. And in the picture, we can see one of the brothers holding the shard as the family proudly displays their fortune, hinting that the shard is what brought them their riches in the first place. And here's the thing. The Shard of Agony, too, is rumored to be a Sheikah artifact, just like the Lens of Truth. It's also made from a green crystal, another possible connection to the green substance. It's never revealed how the family came into possession of the Shard of Agony, but what is clear is that their insatiable cravings and greed for riches by abusing the relic ultimately backfired on them, leaving them mutated, deformed, and unable to leave their abode for many years. Yet another example of the dark forces that come with Sheikah-related objects. Not to mention, where have we heard a reference to greed before? Oh yeah, the Shadow Temple. Here lies Hyrule's bloody history of greed and hatred. The hatred part is pretty on the nose, what with the torture and killings and all. But the greed part could just as well be referring to this sought-after magic power, which led to the experimentation, the necromancy, construction of magic artifacts and other dark practices, rather than the conquest for land and power by the Kingdom of Hyrule. It's clear that during and after the war, some individuals like Dompe, the Potion Makers, the family of the Sculptulous House, and another select few gained access to the Sheikah writings, a product of their knowledge and discoveries from the dark times at Kakariko Village. Knowledge which may have been passed on from that moment, even all the way up to Breath of the Wild. Even if the green liquid is not at all related to magic, potions specifically, it could at least still be possible that it is linked to the rise of the dead, the curses, hauntings, and so on. This could also be a hint as to why Ganondorf's corpse refuses to die completely. The forces at work here could be the very same that created the first Redeads, as Ganondorf's body bears some strong resemblances to the infamous undead. Fearing his endless reincarnation, whoever put the seal on the Demon Cane may have used the knowledge of spirit magic to keep him from death and instead froze his body in time, barely alive, yet with a faint, but persistent, heartbeat. And that pretty much sums up the theory. There's a lot of what-ifs in this one, and it's pretty extensive too, covering multiple mysteries at the same time, but I hope I was able to pitch in some new ideas. And of course, be sure to share your thoughts in the comments below so we can get a good, healthy discussion going. I would like to thank Nintendo Black Crisis for joining me in this video. We also worked on another video together on his channel in which we talk about some of the biggest scams found in the Zelda series, so if you like this video, be sure to give that one a watch too. The link will be in 
in the description and in the pinned comment. A big thanks as always goes to my gracious Patreons and members who continue to make my content possible and a joy to work on. We've got quite a lot of new faces since the last few videos, so if you will, give a big warm welcome to Ketochi, Ian He... I cannot pronounce your last name, Kyle Marsh, Aaron Hare, Cornelius H. Belmont, Ten North, Sora Nelson and Isaac M. DeWitt. How amazing of you to join. I cannot thank you all enough for the support. Anyway, this has been a fun one and I hope you found it entertaining. I will see you all in the next video. This is Don signing off and have a good one.